very good evening friends so happy to see you once again the third class on this uh, intense revision program so again today like yesterday we'll be talking about some of the very important concepts of climatology see as i already said climatology as a chapter is very important for preliminary examination going by the past somewhere i understand among the questions that is asked in world geography world geography or say for example even if not in world geography i'll put it this way physical geography including physical geography of india and physical geography of the world put together both put together the number of questions asked in climatology is what very high nearly one third of the questions are asked in climatology that's the reason somewhere around two and a half classes we have devoted for climatology geomorphology only one class we have taken okay now right before getting into the say for example today's revision class as you already know right if at all if needed current <coughs> kindly use the ongoing offers avail 20 percentage of the discount right and more than that uh, people students who are preparing for this year's preliminary examination 21st may there is a special marathon classes which will be happening continuously for 8 hours for current affairs alone right all the important areas that was there in news for the last one year will be discussed and on uh, may 12th and may 13th three hours each you'll be having this marathon special marathon session on csat right and of course on uh, may 14th the mcqs very important mcqs right it means mcqs which will be say for example almost all those topics what was thought in the earlier classes that is on 7th may which was mostly focused on the important topics. Similarly, we'll be coming up with MCQs, which can be practiced on the similar fashion. So 14th May, subject-wise discussion of the MCQs will be happening or it will be handled by the different faculties, right? Almost it is a eight hours of continuous classes you'll be having on this day, right, my dear friends? Having said that, getting into the, the topic of today's class, climatology. The likely topic, what exactly we'll be discussing today Somewhere we have planned for 10 different topics. We'll be talking about wind, say for example, though I have just somewhere divided this wind into different, say for example, subtopics. Regulators of the wind, planetary winds, local winds, jet stream, etc. All that if I just take it, right? It means I can integrate the entire thing under one concept called as what wind. Similarly, when I talk about, say for example, atmospheric humidity types of condensation, precipitation forms and types, right? I can integrate with one topic called as what hydrological soil right and tropical and temperate cyclone put together i can put it as one single topic called as cyclones it means technically speaking only three topics we are going to discuss today one is wind in details the hydrological cycle the cycle that exists between evaporation condensation and precipitation we'll be discussing about then we'll be talking about the two different types of cyclone as such okay right my difference one by one somewhere if i just start with i'll start with the regulators of the wind for that i should understand what exactly is a wind and what exactly is causing this horizontal movement of this air mass called as wind see when i say wind very technically speaking wind you call them as what advection you call them as what advection or simply you say that the wind is nothing but what horizontal movement of an air mass so any air mass that moves parallel to the surface i call them as what advection or wind See here geography though these words has its own technical meaning what you can do at best right somewhere i said convection you simply take it convection is nothing but what vertical movement of an air mass whereas advection is nothing but what horizontal movement of an air mass now normally what happens my dear friends maybe either it is due to the thermal effectivity or the mechanical action maybe here for example sake i'm just taking the temperature alone right wherever the temperature is higher Wherever the temperature is higher, they're all what you experience is a rising convection. So as and when you experience this rising convection, right? As and when the air mass rises, as and when the air mass rises, the rising air mass creates a void at the surface. It creates the void at the surface, right? And this void is what we call them as what convection, right? And similarly, wherever the temperature is somewhere, right, lesser, 
or say for example due to any mechanical action if the air mass starts subsiding the subsiding air mass will get accumulated at the surface level creating what kinetation okay so one thing i understand wherever there is a rising convection either due to temperature or the mechanical action when the air mass starts rising the rise of the air mass creates a void at the surface called as a bow pressure it causes a deficit and whenever and wherever i experience a subsiding convection takes place it creates a surplus called as what high pressure right so if you ask me what exactly creates this pressure difference is it temperature maybe temperature is one of the reason because yesterday's class we have also seen say for example even mechanical action can create what this pressure okay in that way my dear friends here i assume the temperature is the one which is resulting in convection vertical movement of an air mass convection is the process which creates what pressure difference so what is the immediate cause of pressure difference if you ask me it is all about convection vertical movement of an air mass once the pressure is created then comes a compensatory mechanism from where the surplus region this air mass tends to move towards what a deficit region right advection you call them as advection or layman's understanding you call them as what wind wind is a compensating mechanism wind tries to compensate right the difference that exists between two things it always moves from a surplus region to a deficit has to have something like that okay so wind somewhere compensates that pressure difference that exists between two places now here in this entire diagrammatic representation what is that i have to understand here is very simple what causes pressure if you ask me the causative factor of pressure is convection See, this convection can either be resulted by temperature or by mechanical action, right? Mechanical action, either of it, either of it. If at all of it is created by mechanical action, you call them as what thermal indirect pressure comes. So convection is the one which is resulting in the pressure difference. And once the pressure difference is created, there comes the horizontal movement of the air mass called as what? Advection. So what causes what? We have an idea, right? Now, my dear friends. wind always moves from high pressure to low pressure okay wind means horizontal displacement so having an idea what exactly is a wind now first and foremost i should understand where all i'll be having a wind see predominant winds are at two places one at the surface level and two at the tropopause level because see whenever an air mass is rising i understood that okay it creates a low pressure at the surface but when the air mass gets piled up at the tropopause level it creates a high pressure too. similarly the subsidence of air mass can create a high pressure at the surface but the same subsidence of the air mass creates a low pressure at the tropopause level so it means any pressure system you have in the surface if i take it at the tropopause level i'll be having what the opposite type okay so what i understand at tropopause level also i'll be having the air mass moving from high pressure to low pressure okay so predominantly we'll be having wind flowing at two different places number one at the surface called a surface advection and at the tropopause level you call them as what upper air advection okay that's what in the next slide somewhere i've just described described when i talk about wind wind you call them as what advection this wind my dear friends flowing at the surface you call them as what surface wind and flowing at the tropopause level you call them as what upper air wind okay now the surface wind is very very important because what right somewhere a larger understanding is right when it talk about surface wind right what almost say for example decides or determines a type of a climate is what the surface wind okay plays a very important role i'm not saying that jet stream do not play an important role but the major role is played by the surface wind so this surface wind is classified based on the area what exactly it covers so among the surface winds which is very very large say for example which covers a larger say for example planet or say for example this planetary regions or which is very very large which covers a very large regions you call them as what planetary winds you call them as what planetary winds it means almost it covers the near complete breadth length and breadth of this earth you call them as planetary winds very small area winds we call them as what local winds and anything which lies in between we call them as what regional winds okay so we have planetary winds we have local winds and we have regional winds regional winds they are also very large 
but not to the size of planetary bodies. Finest example of a regional wind, if you ask me, okay, what is the best example of a regional wind? Monsoon. Monsoon is a classical example of a regional wind. Okay. On the other hand, my friends, on the other hand, we talk about planetary winds. Totally, we have six winds. Even yesterday's class we have taken up, right? Between seven pressure belts, I said, we have six planetary winds. Six planetary winds we have. Right? We have six planetary winds as such. Okay. Now, what are the six planetary winds? Though I have six planetary winds, it is three into two. When I say three into two, my dear friends, three per hemisphere we have. Trade wind, westerly and polar winds. Right? Both northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere put together, totally we have what? Six winds. Okay? So, planetary winds are totally six in numbers, but three specific names it takes. We'll just talk about it. We'll talk about it. Regional winds will be deciding or somewhere we'll be discussing in the next class, right? Local winds will be taking and discussing in what? Today's class itself. And we do have winds which flows at the tropopause level, right? Upper R winds. These winds we call them as what? Jet streams. We call them as what? Jet streams, right? Right, my dear friends. So one by one we have to take it and we have to discuss in detail. And before that, we have to discuss about these regulators of wind. See, whenever I say wind, Wind predominantly has some character. It means wind has a velocity. Correct? So based on the velocity, we classify this wind. For example, maybe layman's understanding when I talk about breeze. What is a very breeze if you ask me? Very slow moving winds, we call them as what breeze? So wind has a velocity. Okay. Similarly, when I talk about my difference, wind has a velocity. Wind also has a direction. For example, when I say monsoon, we have monsoon. Southwest monsoon is a monsoon. Northeast monsoon is a monsoon. So, what exactly is southwest and northeast, if you ask me, they are directions. That means wind has a direction. Okay. Any wind you take it, my dear friends, wind will be having a direction. So, when I talk about regulators of the wind, what determines the velocity and what determines the direction of the wind is what we call them as what? Regulators of wind. So, first topic of the day, we are going to talk about the regulators of the wind. Right. First and foremost. The most important regulator of the wind, the very important regulator of the wind, we call them as what? Pressure gradient force. I have not given it here. This force, you call them as what? Pressure gradient force. Call them as what? Pressure gradient force. So, what is this pressure gradient force? A force which is created due to the pressure difference that exists between two places. You call them as what? Pressure gradient force. Right? A force that is created due to the pressure difference that exists between two different places. So, what exactly makes the wind to move from one place to another, if you ask me, it is pressure gradient force. PGF is the one which makes it to move from one place to another. Okay. And my dear friends, and uh, one thing always you would have come across somewhere, they say, pressure gradient force. In short, I am just writing it as PGF. Pressure gradient force in general, right? Right? Pressure gradient force acts perpendicular, perpendicular, or maybe I will write it in words itself, right? Perpendicular to isobars. Perpendicular to isobars. Okay. See, when I say pressure gradient force acts perpendicular to isobars, what is the meaning? Say, for example, I know what is isobars. Bar means pressure. So, line joining places having same pressure, I call them as what isobars. Assume that these are isobars. Give some values 1020 millibars, 1015 millibars, 1010 millibars. Just this is just for namesake, 1005 millibars, etc. So, what I understand here. When I say pressure gradient force acts perpendicular to the isobars means this pressure gradient force will try to take the wind from one isobar to another isobar taking the minimum possible distance. It means if you somewhere take the angle, it will be perpendicular to the isobars. That is the meaning. Okay. Right. It means somewhere pressure gradient force will try to take the wind to move from one place to another or one isobar to another isobar higher isobar to lower isobar, taking the minimum possible distance. 
technically you call them as what displacement okay right now here what is the pressure gradient for somewhere i said the force that is created due to the pressure difference that exists between two plates what is very important here is this pressure gradient force determines both direction and velocity right say for example normally technically we say the pressure gradient force is steep if it is very steep the velocity of the wind will be very high. If the pressure gradient force is gentle yield, then the velocity of the wind will be very less. Okay, that much detail is not needed. But somewhere I should know that pressure gradient force acts perpendicular to isobars. That is very important. Okay, and it determines both direction as well as the velocity of wind. Again, this is very important. Okay, right, my dear friends. Then comes another very important force called as Coriolis force. See, this Coriolis force. Is a deflective force, my dear friends. It's a deflective force. When I say Coriolis force is a deflective force, what is the meaning? I'll tell you. Any moving unstable mass, anything which is moving parallel to the earth's surface, but not attached, grounded with the surface, if it is somewhere oscillating, if it is moving, not attached, as I said, repeatedly said, not attached with the surface. Normally, it comes under the influence of Coriolis force. It's a deflective force. Okay. So, any moving unstable mass coming under the influence of Coriolis force will get deflected. In that way, the pattern of deflection is almost, say, for example, it is uniform. My dear friends. For example, if you are there in northern hemisphere, the pattern of deflection is towards the right. If you are there in southern hemisphere, the pattern of deflection is towards what? Right? You have, say, for example, one direction of deflection. For example, if a wind is moving in a particular direction, this wind coming under the influence of Coriolis force gets deflected towards the right and eventually flows in a set direction. Right? It simply deflects the wind towards the right. Right? And one more thing, this right is not your right, this right is not our right. Right? Your right or my right. It is with respect to the movement of the wind itself, I should say, which is right. Okay? Right. Very important force, my dear friends. And what is a causative factor? Why exactly I have this Coriolis force? Coriolis force is resulted due to the rotation of earth. Right? It is due to the rotation of earth. What is a causative factor? Somewhere I said. Rotation. How is not needed? How is not needed? Right? And one more thing. Coriolis force effectivity is not uniformly distributed. For example, if one statement if I say... Coriolis effectivity increases with increasing latitude. You increase the latitude, Coriolis effectivity also increases. In that way, where exactly I have the minimum Coriolis effectivity is at equator, 0 percentage. It means what? Coriolis force is absent at equator. As I increase the latitude, Coriolis effectivity also increases. That is the idea. Okay. Right, my dear friends. So, Coriolis force, generally it is not present in equator and this is one of the reasons why equatorial regions we do not have cyclones. Very, very important. Okay. Cyclones are not there in equator. If you ask me what is the reason for it, because one of the factors later we will understand what makes cyclone as a circulation is Coriolis force. Since Coriolis force is absent at equator and minimum in equatorial region, we will not have cyclones in equatorial region. Now, what is the direction of deflection? I said northern hemisphere it is right, southern hemisphere it is left. Okay. So, we, when we had an idea about Coriolis force as such. Then comes frictional drive. And Coriolis force determines only the direction, my dear friends. Coriolis force gets influenced by the velocity. But Coriolis force itself will not determine what velocity. Okay. Right, my dear friends. Now, Coriolis force we have done with. Then frictional drive. Name itself says frictional drive. Friction. The friction is more, velocity will be less. Normally, if you ask me land versus water, where exactly friction will be more? Obviously, land friction will be more. That's the reason. The wind which flows in the land will be comparatively less in velocity. Whereas, a wind which flows in water will be having more in velocity. Simplest example, cyclones. Cyclones, you will be having the presence of cyclones in the oceanic region or water body, somewhere around 4 or 5 days, slowly, suddenly, it will get intensified also. 
cyclone itself is classified based on the velocity of the wind. Very technically they say any wind which has a sustained velocity of more than 63 kilometers per hour, you call them as what? Cyclones. So cyclones are known for high intense or high velocity winds. But the same cyclone when it enters the land, hardly it lives for one day. Why? Because land friction is more. That's the reason cyclone will start dissipating, it will lose its character. Right? In that way, my dear friends, even planetary winds for that case, if I just take, for example, we have plenty of planetary winds, plenty of planetary winds we have, right? In that way, among the winds, right, all the planetary winds, if you ask me, which is the fastest moving wind, if you ask me? As of now, we do not know the planetary winds. If I am just showing you the planetary winds, right? Even yesterday's class, this slide will be there, right? At least, say for example, we have six planetary winds. Polar winds, westerlies and trade. Similarly, trade winds and westerlies and polar winds of the southern hemisphere. Among these winds, right, generally when I talk about this westerly winds, my friends, if not now, later, right, uh, somewhere. Later, if you can compare this particular planetary winds with your physical map of the world, you will be finding that this northwestern westerly or this westerly wind largely flows in the oceanic region. The land intrusion is what very, very less. That's the reason among all the planetary winds, this wind is known for the highest velocity. Highest velocity. Okay. Because the near complete flow of this wind is over what? Water. Okay, it flows over water. Okay. Right, my dear friends. Now, that's the reason this latitude also has a nickname. If you ask me what exactly is a nickname, these are the nicknames. We call them as what? Roaring 40s, Furious 50s and Shrieking 60s. Nothing to do with the age, right? All this says, Roaring 40s means standing at this place, you'll be feeling as though this wind is roaring. This wind reaching 50 degree latitude, south latitude will become so furious. You standing at 60 degree latitude, you will hear as though a child is screaming in your ears. This wind will be flowing in such a velocity that it creates a sound which is very similar to the screaming sound of a child. That's why you call them as what? Screaming 60s. Sometimes you also call them as what? Shrieking 60s. All this says one thing. All this terminology says one thing. What exactly it says? It says that you have very high velocity. Why exactly the velocity of the wind is very high? Simple. It is all because of what? Water domination. In water, friction will be less. Similarly, my dear friends, even jet stream, if you ask me, jet stream, name itself says jet stream. Why exactly the velocity of the wind is so high there, if you ask me? Frictional drag is almost negligible. Okay. So, friction also plays a very important role. But friction determines what property of this wind, if you ask me, only velocity. Right. Then, my dear friends, when I talk about Within the land, I have different features, mountain, plateau and plains. Normal common sense itself says, mountain I will be having more friction, plains I will be having less friction. That's the reason my dear friends, east coast of India is more vulnerable to cyclonic surge. right? Because somewhere I understand east coast of India, what is more is what? The coastal plains. West coast of India, what we have is immediate to the west coast is what? Western Ghats, right? So, it means, say for example, this plains are very limited in west coast. What is more near the west coast is what? Mountains. That's the reason the landfall of the cyclones are not so common along the west coast. But east coast of India, landfall is very, very common. Frictional drag also plays a very important. These are the regulators of the wind velocity shifts, okay? Then now we'll talk about planetary wind. The second topic of the day, we call them as what planetary winds. See, we we'll talk about planetary planetary winds, my dear friends. Very large area winds. These winds almost covers the length and breadth of the entire world, of, right? Almost. For example, even yesterday's class we talked about the seven pressure belts. I said four names, but seven pressure belts. Equatorial region, I have equatorial low. Subtropical region, I have subtropical high. Subpolar region, I have subpolar low. Polar regions, I have polar high. Every 30 degree. If you travel north and south, low will become high and high will become low. Zero degree, I have equatorial low. 
30 degree, I have subtropical side. 60 degree, I have subpolar blue. 90 degree, I have polar blue. Assuming that you remember these pressure points as such. Now, you also know the fact, right? Somewhere I know the fact that when I talk about wind, wind always moves from high pressure to low pressure. What you are seeing here is a dotted lines. This is pressure gradient force. I know the fact that pressure gradient force will try to make the wind moving from what? High pressure to low pressure, taking the minimum possible distance. But I understand pressure gradient force is not the only force which will be determining what? The direction of the wind. Right? Direction of the wind is also influenced by what Coriolis force. What you are seeing is the Coriolis deflection. If they are in northern hemisphere, what is the direction of deflection? Direction of deflection is what? Towards right. If you are there in southern hemisphere, the direction of deflection is what? Towards left. Right? So, towards right and towards left. Now, see, resultant, the bold lines shows this resultant wind direction. And I also always know the fact, or I should put it this way, wind is always named from where exactly this is coming from. Okay. Wind is always named from the source where exactly it is coming from. What is the reason for naming in that fashion? Very simple. Because where this wind is ultimately going, we do not know. At least we know that where exactly it is coming from. That's the reason. Normally, we have named it after the direction from which it comes from. For example, somebody saying land breeze means what? This wind is going from land to sea. If I take the reference called a sea breeze, means what? A breeze which is coming from sea. If I say it is a mountain breeze, means coming from the mountain. In that way, if I just talk about southwest monsoon, what is the meaning? Coming from southwestern direction. Northeastern monsoon, coming from the northeastern direction. So, wind is always named from which direction it comes from. Now see, if I just apply this concept of this wind direction here, polar wind of the northern hemisphere is coming in northeasterly direction. Westerlies of the northern hemisphere flows in southwestern direction. Trade winds of the northern hemisphere flows in northeastern direction. Whereas, trade wind of the southern hemisphere flows in southeastern direction. Westerlies of the southern hemisphere flows in northwestern direction. Polar winds of the southern hemisphere flows in southeastern direction. Now, here, my dear friends, somewhere if I am just going for a binary classification, no, let me divide these winds into easterly and westerly. Now, I can understand what is easterly wind? Wind which comes from the east, you call them as what easterly wind? A wind which comes from the west, you call them as what westerly wind. Okay. Slightly, I will change the direction, right? A wind which comes from the west, you call them as what? Westerly winds. In that way, all this north and south divide, if I am just taking it. Now, let me take or let me differentiate the wind either based on, right? Okay, I will put it, right? Easterly versus westerly winds as such. In that way, my dear friends. If you ask me, what are the winds that comes from the east? Polar winds comes from the east. Trade wind comes from the east. That's the reason if you ask me what are the easterly winds we have. Polar winds and trade winds are easterly winds. And what is the only wind which comes from the west? The only wind which comes from the west is westerly. Right? The only wind which comes from the west is westerly. That's the reason this wind is called as westerly wind. All other winds are called as easterly winds. Okay? The only wind which comes from the west is westerly. Okay? Right, my dear. So now, how to remember the direction? Very simple. First, you remember easterly winds. If westerly is the only westerly wind, remaining polar wind and trade was easterly wind. Okay. Now, how to remember? Wind coming from the east is easterly. This easterly winds of northern hemisphere will be northeasterly. Similarly, the easterly winds of southern hemisphere will be southeasterly. Northern hemisphere, easterly wind will be northeast. Southern hemisphere, easterly wind will be southeast. You cannot have a better remembrance than this. Okay. So, make it very simple. Northern hemisphere, easterly wind, northeasterly. You see, polar winds, northeasterly, trade wind, northeasterly. Southern hemisphere, easterly wind, southeasterly, southeastern trade wind, southeastern polar wind. Okay. So, very easily you can remember. That's the reason normally we say easterly winds are hemisphere specific. 
Lo que crear es más fiesta. Right, my friends. Planetary events. If I just take the direction of easterly wind, for example, northern hemisphere, if I remember somewhere, if I know that polar winds are northeasterly, coming from northeastern direction, westerly will be exactly opposite, southwest. Or somewhere, if you are forgetting in the examination, then also I'll tell you how to remember it. You take the northern hemisphere. You take the northern hemisphere. Take the example of monsoon. India experienced two monsoon. What are the two monsoon? One is southwest monsoon, another is what? Northeastern monsoon. Right? It means if you are there in northern hemisphere, any large wind will be having only two directions. What are the two directions? Either it will be southwesterly or it will be northeastern. Okay? They will be having only two large directions. Okay? As I said, either it will be southwesterly or it will be northeasterly. Monsoon is the classical example. Right? So, very easily you can remember these winds as such, my dear friends. Right? So, what are the winds? Six winds in total. Three specific names, we have an idea. Approximately where to where it flows also, we have an idea. For example, trade wind you take it, they flow from subtropical high to equatorial low. That is 30 degree to 0 degree. We talk about the westerly wind of the northern hemisphere. Subtropical high to subpolar, 30 degree to 60 degree. Either 30 degree north to 60 degree north, 30 degree south to 60 degree south. Simply I said 30 degree to 60 degree. Right. 2017, they have asked one exam means one question. They have given 30 degree. I said 30 degree to 60 degree. It is correct. What they have given an examination is 30 degree north to 60 degree south, which is wrong. Because if it is 30 degree north, here also it should be 60 degree north. If it is 30 degrees south, here also it should be 60 degrees south. It means it will not cross the equator. That's a very small, say for example, very small, right? It means, say for example, that trick they have played with. Okay, whatever it is the case, right? Where to where it flows, we have an idea. Okay. And my difference, these latitudes also has a nickname. For example, equatorial low has a nickname. What is a nickname if you ask me? It is either called as doldrum or IT season. IT season means intertropical convergence zone. Doldrum is one area where the windless region of the equatorial belt, we call them as what? Doldrum. No wind. Not only here, any place, see for example, any pressure system itself you take it. Either you are there at the very center of the low pressure or you are there at the center of the high pressure. If you are putting yourself in the center of this low pressure or high pressure, you will not experience wind. There is no wind. Okay. So, that windless region of the equatorial belt, you call them as what? Doldra. Similarly, my different subtropical high also has a nickname. What is the nickname for subtropical high? You call them as what? Horse latitude. See, you have an anecdote for what why exactly this latitude is called as horse latitude. We have an anecdote. But that anecdote is not, say, for example, so important as such. Only things that I have to remember that subtropical high, right? Subtropical high is otherwise called as horse latitude. Similarly, when talk about subpolar low, subpolar low is called as mid latitude. 60 degree the north and south is called as mid latitude. So, what is the nickname, my dear friends? Very important. All three nicknames are very important. Equatorial low is called as doldrum or IT season. Subtropical high, 30 degree north and south latitudes, they are called as horse latitudes. 60 degree north and south latitudes, you, are called, you call them as what? Mid latitudes. Okay. Very, very important. So, that's all about planetary winds, my dear friends. Now, regional wind, we'll take it separately, we'll discuss in detail. Now, talking about local winds. See, when talk about local winds, they are small area winds. Small area winds, or sometimes you also call them as what? Gradient wind. A wind that is created due to the local pressure difference, right? You call them as what? Local winds. It can be because of the topographic difference. It can be because of the vegetation. It can be because of the, say for example, the local factors. You call them as what? Local winds. Very small area winds. In that way, wherever I have this 
coastal areas. Wherever I have adjoining sea regions, I will be having the sea breeze and land breeze. For example, when I talk about say for example this normal sea breeze and land breeze, logic is very simple. I know the fact that water maintains the temperature. In that way, let us take our own example, the lower latitudinal example. You are there in a coastal area. Normally what happens? During the daytime, land will become very warm. And I know the fact that water maintains temperature, water will be comparatively colder. Water will not be hot, water will be comparatively colder. Okay. So, water will be somewhere maintaining that temperature. Heating up the water also takes more time. Water losing the heat will also take more time. So, in between water maintains that temperature. Right. Now, my dear friends, I know the fact that land experience warm condition, that is low pressure. Whereas adjoining water comparatively experience a colder condition, thus high pressure. So once this pressure difference is created, pressure difference is created, now what happens? This wind starts moving from high pressure to low pressure. No problem. It means the wind will start moving from sea to land. So that's what you call them as what sea breeze. Night time exactly opposite things takes place. Exactly opposite takes place. Because what happens, land becomes comparatively colder and adjoining sea becomes what? Warm. Right? So, in that way, my dear friends, when I talk about land becoming comparatively colder, so land will create a high pressure, get high pressure, created high pressure here and sea will be experiencing a low pressure. Okay. And because of this fact, I will be having a wind which is moving from land to sea. Okay. The wind moves from land to sea, you call them as what? Land breeze. So, normally, Normally, assume that this is an example of lower latitudinal summers or assume that normal condition. Let us not talk about exceptions. right? So, daytime what you experience is a sea breeze, nighttime what you experience is a land breeze for the coastal areas. See, practical utility, this is where you find the fishermen, right? When you talk about fishermen, normally you will be finding that fishermen will be venturing into the sea during the night time because and not everybody. I am talking about a fisherman who uses this uh, country boats, non-mechanized boats. So, he will be venturing into the sea using the help of land breeze and he will be coming back in the daytime using this sea breeze as such. Okay. So, land breeze and sea breeze. Materials. Then we do have uh, mountain breeze and valley breeze. Materials. We have mountain breeze and valley breeze. See, when I say mountain breeze and valley breeze, Idea says, we talk about mountain breeze, my dear friends. Wind which comes from the mountain, you call them as mountain breeze. Coming from valley, you call them as what? Valley breeze. So, normally what happens, night time, evening time and all what happens, the air mass becomes colder, denser, right? That is coming into contact with the surface. So, what happens is cold air mass will start descending along the slope of the mountain. Sometimes very popularly you call them as what? Air drainage. Like how exactly water will be draining, this air will also drain. So you call them as what? Air drainage, my dear friends. Very technically, we call them as what? Catabatic wind. And see, this is very important. You talk about catabatic wind. If you ask me, what is regulating this wind? Why exactly this wind is flowing? Denser, okay. But is it flowing? Is it flowing from higher pressure to low pressure? If you ask me, no. not like that. Because the air mass is denser, simply it is moving. So, what exactly instigate the very movement is what? Gravity. So, somewhere I understand wind can also be resulted because of gravity. Gravity can also, right, somewhere make the movement of air mass. Now, one question you may ask. Here this air drainage, technically we call them as what? Mountain breeze because this air mass is coming from what? Mountain. Is it horizontal movement? Can I call it as a wind if you ask me? Very much you can call it as a wind because this air drainage also what happens is air mass is moving along the surface. So, any movement of air mass along the surface you can call them as what wind. So, I told you three regulators. What are the three regulators? Pressure gradient force, Coriolis force and frictional impact. Along with this three forces you can also include gravity along with it. Gravity also plays an important role. 
where mountain breeze mountain breeze itself is instigated by this gravity morning what happens my dear friends entire night valley will be filled with cold air masses by the time morning sun rises the sun will be heating up the surface of the mountain first warm condition will be created low pressure will be created so morning what happens that cold air mass creating a high pressure now this cold air mass will start moving towards what this low pressure this breeze which comes from the valley you call them as what valley breeze so normal idea says night time and evening time what you have is mountain breeze morning time what you have is what valley breeze okay right right my dear friends and saw the general winds we have just taken it general winds we have just taken it okay right now apart from this generalized wind common winds we have a specific winds i have given the names of the specific winds and only somewhere i am just categorizing these winds all the winds what i have just given here i have just consolidated it chinook santa ana zonda and fogen they are descending winds of the world blizzards pamperos Buran and Kara Buran, they are very extremely cold and dry winds, polar outbreaks. Bora, Mistral and Bursters of Australia, they are cold winds happening during winters, but they are not very, very intense. Kamsin, Siraku, Harmata, they are dust devils. Dust devils. Dust devils means they are dusty winds. Extremely dusty. It means they are sourced from desert. This wind carries a lot of aerosol supplies along with it as such. Okay, right. Dusty winds as such. Now, my dear friends, one by one, if I'm just taking it. First, I'll just talk about the descending wind. What is this descending wind? If I have a mountain, if I have a mountain, and say, for example, if I have a mountain in between, if a wind somewhere crosses this mountain, using one slope of the mountain, this wind will rise. And using another slope of the mountain, this wind will descend. Okay. So using one slope, it rises. Using another slope, it descends. Okay. So whenever this wind is rising along one slope, every attempt of it is raised, the wind becomes cold and wet. When the wind is descending, this wind becomes warm and dry. Right. See, why I say rising wind becomes cold and wet, I'll tell you. Why it is becoming cold, I understand. Because lapse rate, normal lapse rate. Okay. When the height increases, temperature decreases. Adiabatically, it gets cold. How come wet, if you ask me? Simple, because when you start raising, the height of an air mass increases. The relative humidity also increases. What is relative humidity? The very next right few topics. Right, we will be understanding that what exactly is relative humidity. So, relative humidity increases. So it becomes wet. At one point of time, it goes for condensation. It results in precipitation. That's the reason windward side of any mountain will be, my dear friends, will be wet. Whereas leeward side, if I just take it, if I talk about leeward side, descending winds, every time when it descends, it becomes warmer, right? And it also becomes dry. It's exactly opposite. Rising wind becomes cold and wet. Subsiding wind becomes warm and dry. Right. Now, we will be talking about some of those descending winds of the world. Leeward side of the mighty mountains and these winds are warm and dry winds. Right? They are warm and dry winds. Okay. Now, here, some of the very important such winds, my dear friends. Very important winds. You are there in Rocky Mountain. See, here, you have this Rocky Mountain. Sometimes you also call them as Western Cordillera, Rocky Mountain. And you also have this world's longest mountain called as Andes Mountains. So there are winds which rises and somewhere descends along these Rocky Mountains. One such wind you call them as what? Chinook. Chinook is there in Canada. Right? Chinook is a mountain. Sorry, Chinook is a wind. Which is confined to what? Canada. Rocky Mountains, Canada. It is a favorable wind. How come it is a favorable? See, for example, this nickname itself says Snow Eater. Because this region, somewhere it is known for, say, for example, colder conditions. You will be having more of snowfalls, that too, in winters. 
So once I have a warm and dry winds inundating those places, right? Somewhere I understand this region becomes warmer. So all the snow filled or the snow covers will be somewhere melted away. So the grassland will get exposed. We have a grassland called as prairies there. That grassland get exposed. And of course that is useful for cattle industry or a dairy industries as such. Apart from that even vineyard cult right. Say for example this vineyard cultivation or horticulture and such, horticulture in general, they get benefited out of it. So Chinook is an economically favorable winter conditions. But the similar wind in USA, just south of it, this wind you call them as what Santa, right? This wind you call them as Santa, right? See, similar wind. Chinook, Canada, Santa Ana, USA. But interestingly, Santa Ana is unfavorable. Unfavorable. If you ask me why exactly Santa Ana is unfavorable, Chinook is favorable because the place where exactly Santa Ana is having its effectivity or influence, already this region is what warm. As I said, already this region is warm. Right. Now, my dear friends, when I talk about Santa Ana, Santa Ana is an unfavorable bit, Chinook is a Favorable wind. Similar wind we also have in what? Argentina. This wind we call them as what? Zonda. We call them as what? Zonda. Right. Argentina, we call this wind as Zonda. Right. And Alpine Cordillera, again this wind, similar wind we have. All these winds what I have taken is the descending wind across some of the very important mountains. For example, Chinook and Santa Ana. Descending wind of this mighty mountain called as Rocky Mountains, North America. Zonda is a descending wind of world's longest mountain called as Andes. And when I talk about Fogan, Fogan is the descending wind of Alps. Okay, right. Right, my dear friends, some of the very important winds we have taken. Now, let me talk about some very important cold and dry winds. See, talk about cold and dry winds. Means what? They are coming from colder region and drier region. Either these winds come from the polar region or during the winter, if the air mass gets intensification, means when I talk about the intensification of the air mass is very, very high, then also it becomes what? Somewhere I understand it becomes very cold and very dry. Now, some of them are extremely cold and extremely dry. We call them as a polar outbreak. It means they come from the polar region. Some of the winds which come from the polar region, my dear friends. For example, one such wind, blizzards. This blizzard is very important. This year, this year, somewhere I feel, right? Some of the topic I insist. This year, I feel that blizzards is very, very important here, right? Because uh, the blizzards, what you had in the month of December and January, is one of the most intensified blizzards of the last decade. Very intensified blizzards. Blizzards are extremely cold. Canadian polar outbreak. And they are very common during the peak winters, my dear friends. During winters, what happens? Polar high becomes so intense. It becomes so intense. When polar high becomes very, very intense, my dear friends. Okay. Polar high becomes very, very intense. This polar high pressure will break open. The polar high pressure is breaking open. Somewhere I understand this extremely cold winds will be inundating those tropical regions. They are extremely cold. See how extremely cold if you ask me. Somewhere they say it is a kind of an exaggeration but still worth discussing about this exaggeration. They believe that when the wind crosses any water body, this water body will instantaneously freeze. See it is not going to happen. Instant freezing will not happen but somewhere it can result in freezing of the water bodies. Niagara waterfalls, once in a while it gets completely frozen. And one of the reasons for Niagara being frozen is what? Blizzards. Okay. Right. Right, my dear friends. Blizzards, you are there in North America, source in Canada, destination US. Similar winds, you have Purgas. Asia, you call them as what? Purgas. Or you call them as what? Buran. Either you call them as Purgas or you call them as what? Buran. You call them as Purgas or you call them as what? Buran. Buran Karabra or Purgas. Of course, I understand it is a Siberian polar outbreak. You call them as what? Siberian polar outbreak. 
And my dear friends, these winds do not enter India. It means they also originate from the Siberian polar region. Blizzards also originate from the polar regions of Canada. They travel in a particular direction. They will be traveling mostly in south. Say for example, eastern. Okay, sorry. They move in northeastern in direction. Right. But one thing is that blizzards very easily enters USA. But this Buran or Kara Buran do not enter India. What is the reason for it? Maybe. The reason is Himalaya. Himalayas is the one which somewhere do not allow the cold polar wind from Siberia to enter what? India. Right? Right. That's all the very important winds we have taken. Blizzards, very, very important. Very, 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 very important. Purgas. And similar wind I also have in Argentina. You call them as what? Pamperos. We call them as Pamperos. Now see, when talk about blizzards, uh, normally in news you would have come across a term called as bomb cyclone. A term called as bomb cyclone. Okay. This term we call them as what? Bomb cyclone as such. Now when I talk about this bomb cyclone, what is this bomb cyclone? Maybe. Who knows? Even this question can be asked in prelims. Nobody can say that which question will be asked in prelims, but still. I feel right. If somebody is asking about bomb cyclone, my dear friends, right? What is this bomb cyclone? Almost say, for example, in less than 24 hours, if the pressure drops more than 24 millibars, right? Like a bomb, the low pressure will drop. This phenomena we call them as what? Bomb cyclone. Somewhere this bomb cyclone is associated with blizzards. Even you would have also heard about polar vortex. Polar vortex is also associated with what blizzards. It is also associated with what blizzards. So bomb cyclones or polar vortex, right? Both somewhere, let's give emphasis to it, right? See, polar vortex, vortex means a low pressure. You may wonder how come polar, low pressure and polar region, when I say polar vortex, I'm not talking about the condition which is there at the surface level. I'm talking about the condition which is there at Proposed Okay, right. Now, my friends, are the very important, extremely cold and dry winds of the world we have taken it. Now, on the other hand, when talk about, say, for example, the cold and dry winds, other cold and dry winds, we do have other winds. We have a wind called as Bora, Northern Europe, Bursters, Australia, Mistral, France. These are the, say, for example, other winds of the world. Cold and dry winds, they are also common during what? Winters. Among them, Mistral is very important. Mistral of France, very popular. Right. Now, cold and dry winds of the world we have taken. Right? Now, going to the next type of winds, you call them as what? Dusty winds. See, when I say dusty winds, it means these winds carry a lot of dust. They carry a lot of dust. And these dust, my dear friends, these dust are nothing but what? Very fine elements of sand particles. When I say this dust, they are fine element of sand particles. The fine elements of sand particles. They are more like an aerosols. If you ask me again, where exactly these fine elements of sand particles came from? It means they are sourced from tropical deserts. They are generally common during the dry summer period where the moisture content is very less. The moisture content is more what happens is aerosols. The small, small sand particles will start absorbing the moisture. It will gain its weight. If it is gaining its weight, this aerosol will not get deflated. Rather, it will get settling down somewhere. Okay. So, that's the reason during dry summer seasons, this Dusty winds are very, very common. Sometimes you call them as what? Dust devils. You call them as what? Dust devils. Because the amount of aerosols or the dust it is supplied is what? Very, very high. There is no comparison at all. It is very, very high. Okay. Right, my dear friends. Now, and about dusty winds, yes, we have some of the very important warm and dry winds and most of them, they are sourced from tropical deserts. But here I have just taken the winds which is sourced only from what? 
the world's largest desert called as Sahara. Right? Sahara is the world's largest desert. Now here, we talk about say for example, one such desert, you right, one such wind, you have the name of what? Harmata. Harmata. All these winds are sourced from Sahara. That is there. But see, very interestingly, Harmatan has a nickname and this wind, you call them as a doctor wind. The name itself says, it is a favorable wind. It is a favorable wind. Doctor wind. When I say this wind is a favorable wind, right? How come a dusty wind, sometimes you call them as a dust devils. How come a dusty wind is favorable if you ask me? Very simple. When aerosol supply is more, even yesterday's class we said, Aerosol supply will be reducing the temperature because sun's rays will be scattered. Aerosol scatters sun's rays. So it is already dry summer period. You are very near to a desert region. The temperature is very hot. The aerosol supply in the atmosphere will reduce the temperature by scattering. So one, it will be reducing this right temperature. Number two. Gulf of Guinea region is a coastal area and we understand that coastal area okay. We are talking about the coastal areas my dear friends. Normally coastal areas will not be dry. Coastal areas, the humidity will be comparatively more. Okay. So, given the fact, what I understand here, whenever the aerosol supply is more, already the humidity is very high here. The aerosols will be acting as this hygroscopic nuclei. What is hygroscopic nuclei? That eventually, another half an hour, you will be understanding what is this hygroscopic nuclei. So, what happens is, Armadan as a wind, aerosols will reduce the temperature. Right. Apart from reducing the temperature, my difference, what I understand, right, this hygroscopic nuclei will also helps in aiding precipitation. So that's the reason. The Zarmatan almost brings a welcome precipitation to Gulf of Guinea region. Welcome precipitation means a must anticipated or must, right? Say for example, somewhere a much appreciated precipitation, need of the time. You call them as what? Welcome precipitation. Right. Then we have a wind called a Siraku. Siraku, same Sahara, but the source is southern Europe. See, all this wind are sourced from Sahara. See, we talk about Siraku. Siraku from Sahara, it moves north and just crosses Mediterranean Sea and reaches the southern part of Europe. Now, here what I understand, when this wind is crossing Mediterranean region, I understand this wind is a dry wind. Why? Because source is dry, desert. But any warm wind moisture holding capacity will be more provided availability of the moisture is there. So what happens my dear friends when this wind crosses the Mediterranean Sea? This wind will collect the moisture, carry the moisture, deliver the moisture. Okay. So Siraku also brings some amount of precipitation in southern Europe. And what I understand this precipitation which is resulted by this Siraku, normally it will be red tinted precipitation. It means it will be having some, right, say for example, red color strains. That's the reason the Siraku, we call them as what? Blood rain. See, for that case, any wind or any dusty wind you take, if the dusty wind is resulting in precipitation, the precipitation will be having this sand particle. And finally, one more wind, if I am just adding for the consolidated purpose, Kamsin. This wind is called as Kamsin, Egypt. Source is also a desert, destination is also a desert. It means this wind is not favorable wind. See, uh, roughly two years before, one news was very popular, roughly. One ship called as Ever Given, Company Evergreen has blocked the Suez Canal. Complete uh, sea transport of the world got choked. It blocked the very transport of the Suez Canal. The lifeline of the Mediterranean Sea was blocked. Okay, whatever it is the case. Ship's name is Ever Given, Company name is Ever Given. 
But what exactly has happened, if you ask me, that ship got entangled in a sandstorm. And that sandstorm is nothing but what comes in. Only thing is that what has made, say for example, this ship to eventually block the very route of the Suez Canal, right? Is this comes in as a thing. Okay. So comes in was there in news, if not con current issues, contemporary issues, I can always add it. Okay. So these are some of the winds, local winds of the world. Now talking about local winds of India locations. This is the season. For example, if you ask me when exactly you'll be experiencing these local winds of India. Normally local winds of India, they are very common during the mid-March to mid-June as a period. Technically we say it is very common during about dry summer as a period. Dry summer. See for example, when we talk about Indian seasons, my dear friends, we have four seasons in India. What are the four seasons? Dry winters, dry summers, advancing monsoon, retreating monsoon. We will be studying about this in Indian climate. Four seasons. Dry winter, dry summer, advancing monsoon and retreating monsoon. In that way, all these local winds of India is confined to mid-March to mid-June. You call them as dry summer as a period. And this dry summer as a period comes just before this monsoon. And that's the reason this, say for example, the seasonal winds resulting in this very small amount of precipitation is sometimes also called as pre-monsoonal showers. You also call them as what? Pre-monsoonal showers. Okay. Right, my dear. So now some of the local winds of India. When exactly I'll be having this local wind, I have just told you. Dry winter, sorry, excuse me, dry summer as a period, I understand. Because this wind just comes before the advent of monsoon. These winds, we also call them as what? Pre-monsoonal showers. And what are the winds? And most of these winds are named after the plantation crops, which gets benefited out of it. Because these winds deliver some precipitation or showers. These showers are very, very, very beneficial for the plantation crop because plantation crops are the long-standing crops. And see the season, dry summers. Temperature is also warmer, days are longer and it is dry. When I say dry summer, my dear friends, the need of water will be more. But the availability of the water will be less. Okay. So going by that logic, my dear friends, going by that logic, most of these local winds of India, most of these local winds of India, they are favorable winds because they bring timely precipitation to this, say for example, plantation. In that way, most of these precipitations, local winds, they are named after the plantation which gets benefited out of it. For example, you call them as mango showers. Karnataka is very popular, very popular. A small showers what you experience in Karnataka nowadays, it's nothing but what mango showers. Right? Last weeks of April, early weeks of May, mango sugar. Beneficial mango plantation. Not only Karnataka, it's Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka and parts of Tamil Nadu. So predominantly west coast, that is okay. Predominantly west coast or even I can say mostly Konkan coast. So, Konkan coast, slightly Konkan and slightly inside also you can take it. These are the places which we get, which gets what? Mango showers. April showers. Or sometimes you call them as what? Mango showers. Then we have a wind called as tea showers. Name itself says which plantation it gets benefited. Tea plantation. Right? Tea plantation gets benefited. Many friends. And when I talk about say for example tea plantation, right? Tea showers. Where exactly I'll be having these tea showers? West Bengal and Assam, my dear friends. These tea showers are very, very popular. We call them as what? Tea showers. Sometimes also called as Bardoli Chira. We call them as what? Bardoli Chira. We call them as what? Tea showers. Then you have a wind called as Blossom Showers. Either you call them as Blossom Showers or the name suggests you also call them as what? Cherry Blossom. Cherry blossom. And if you ask me which plantation gets benefited out of this uh, blossom showers, is it a cherry plantation? If you ask me, we don't have any cherry plantation as such. It is for coffee plantation because this coffee, this bean is there, right? 
when this beam starts ripening it looks like a bunch of cherries so during that time timely watering is needed so some of the plantations gets benefited out of this rainfall also that's the point what i'm just trying to say okay right so these are some of the very important winds and we do have some destructive wind west bengal we have this wind called as kal baisakhi kal means black dark suggesting cumulonimbus clouds baisakhi is a month okay uh, it's a kind of a cyclonic precipitation slightly disastrous in nature kal baisakhi sometimes also you call them as what norwester means what a wind which comes from what northwestern direction northwest and india also has a desert called as thar desert you are there in western rajasthan and we do have a dusty wind which will be affecting the larger part of gangetic plain source is thar desert but destination is larger part of gangetic plain right so we do have some destructive winds loose a destructive wind kal baisakhi is also destructive see lu you may argue what is this how come you are saying destructive lu as a wind will carry lot of aerosols that will reduce the temperature otherwise delhi and the northern plains of india is very very hot during summers lu should be a beneficial wind see when i talk about beneficial wind why only in climatological aspect i should talk about it beneficial means to whom what to people because this lu can also bring what health hazards in people okay is all about wind in all directions we have done it right one more wind is available this wind okay is pending all the surface winds we have done with now moving on to the upper air wind this upper air wind you call them as what jet streams you call them as jet stream see what is a jet stream somewhere i told you right wind will be predominantly blowing at the surface or the wind will be flowing at the tropopause level also it will be flowing at tropopause level also so the wind which flows at the surface which flows at the surface right you call them as a surface wind the winds which flows at the tropopause level you call them as what tropopause wind sorry excuse me you call them as what upper air wind or you simply you call them as what jet streams now see this wind is called as jet streams it means these are fast moving winds how fast normally they move more than they have a velocity of more than 200 kilometers per hour okay the fast moving centers of a geostrophic wind you call them as what jet stream okay now my dear friends this jet streams are there in both the hemisphere at two places jet stream will be predominantly flowing somewhere at the subtropical level right at the subtropical level see for example somewhere at the 30 degree latitude mark also we have a jet stream which is flowing 60 degree latitude mark also will be having a jet stream which is flowing but they flow at the surface level they flow at the surface level sorry excuse me they flow at the tropopause level okay right now both the winds are very very important where exactly it is flowing somewhere i am just giving you an idea right where exactly this winds are flowing right subtropical jet stream somewhere along this horse latitude polar jet stream somewhere along this subpolar region okay where exactly we flow and what is very interesting northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere both we have this jet stream right but how exactly they flow my dear friends they almost flow in a wavy pattern and because of the coriolis effectivity is very very high what happens this wind almost becomes parallel to the isobars any wind that is parallel to isobars becomes parallel to isobars we call them as what geostrophic winds we call them as what geostrophic winds these are the winds which generally flows parallel to isobars right jet stream is a geostrophic wind cyclone is a geostrophic wind so any wind starts moving parallel to isobars you call them as what geostrophic winds okay now here these jet stream my difference almost becomes or moves in a direction 
largely i can say this wind starts moving from what east to west it means the rarest occasion jet stream can also be called as easterly this is one interpretation jet stream can also be called as what easterly because this wind moves from east to west right right my dear so they encircle the entire earth they makes a kind of a garland system right so totally i have jet stream two jet streams in one hemisphere and the replica of the same in southern hemisphere we have and this jet stream my dear friends during winters alone during winters the two jet stream becomes three jet stream how very simple i have something called as polar jet this polar jet gets intensified and eventually gets bifurcated into two jet streams what are they one it is polar night jet very intense number two it is polar frontal jet this frontal jet is somewhere around the 60 degree latitude polar night jet is completely there in what the polar regions as such okay so we'll be having this polar jet itself will be say for example getting divided into two right further jet streams so that's the reason some of the books you will be finding that the number of jet streams are two in numbers they are two in numbers some of the books you will be finding that they are three in numbers right so what exactly is the basic difference between this two and three somewhere we are taking not every time my friends let me tell you during winters alone polar jet get what bifurcated so what is a jet stream approximately we have an idea these are fast to moving centers of a geostrophic wind which has a velocity of more than 200 km per hour they roughly move in east to west direction and as the case it encircles the entire earth it encircles the entire earth it it makes more like a garland system for the entire earth as such jet stream upper air geostrophic wind so every word has a meaning when i say upper air upper air right when i say upper air these winds are flowing at tropopause level that's what the meaning is right upper air upper air geostrophic when i talk about geostrophic when i talk about geostrophic i told you right any wind which flows parallel to isobars you call them as what geostrophic isobars that's the reason we say jet streams are upper air geostrophic winds so what is jet stream approximately we have an idea now see in one way jet stream is very important for indian condition because one precipitation is actually caused by jet stream that precipitation that is caused by jet stream in india we call them as what western disturbance or collectively the winter precipitation in india you call them as what western disturbance see normally when i talk about the seasons in india what are the seasons in india we have dry summer i'll start with the dry winters so that it will be cyclical now we have four seasons number one is dry winters two is a dry summer three is advancing monsoon or southwest monsoon fourth is retreating monsoon or northeastern monsoon see monsoon southwest monsoon and northeastern monsoons they are wet spell then comes the question right when i talk about say for example this dry summers though i use this word called as dry are they really dry if you ask me no this is a time when you somewhere we experience what this local showers right local showers cherry blossom tea showers mango showers bardoli chira kal baisakhi all these precipitation we experience during what dry summer then comes the question dry winters is this dry winters really dry if you ask me no again this region comes under the or this season comes under the influence of what western disturbance western disturbance it means there is no season in india right where india do not experience precipitation there is no dry seasons in india individually regionally i can have this difference but entire country somewhere or another some precipitation will be taking place right it means all four different seasons somewhere understanding is yes yes you experience what precipitation now which part of india experience that winter precipitation if you ask me which part of india experience that winter precipitation simple 
north western part of india or sometimes in a lighter moment we can say which part of india experience winter precipitation if you ask me so whichever part of india experience winter that part of india experience winter precipitation which part of india experience winter if you ask me true winters northwestern part of india why only northwestern part of india two reasons are cited for it for experiencing true winters two reasons are cited for it number one it should be as away from equator number two it should be away from the coastal areas coastline it should be away from coast because as you are located more away from the equator the difference in the length between summer and winter is what very very effective you can somewhere very well you can see the same on the other hand when i talk about say for example the places which is very near to equator places like kanyakumari and all the length or difference between the summer day and winter days are not so great but as you move away summer you will be knowing you will be witnessing that sun will be rising very early winter sun will be coming very late am i right so number one away from the equator number two away from the coastline because water maintains temperature somewhere if you are there in the coastline larger idea says this region will not become very very say for example hot or cold many times even during say for example this winters it may not become very cold or during summers it may not become very hot okay that's the reason i said northwestern part of india is the one which experience what winter precipitation in india and this precipitation is actually resulted by which jet stream if you ask me subtropical jet subtropical jet and jet is just a wind and what carries the moisture from where exactly this moisture is carried from if you ask me it is sourced from if you ask me it is sourced from mediterranean sea it is sourced from mediterranean sea right largely this air mass rises and gets added to this jet stream so this moisture is further carried by this jet stream and for nearly when i talk about say for example northwestern part of india when the cold himalayan winds comes into contact with this say for example this jet streams it will be resulting in what precipitation it will be resulting in precipitation so somewhere why northwestern part of india experience this precipitation we have justified <coughs> excuse me we have justified it right so all facts about jet stream we have taken what is jet stream we have taken how many jet streams are there in the world that also we have taken one jet stream induced precipitation in india we have taken it there i also said where exactly the moisture comes from the moisture comes from what the mediterranean sea as such okay right my friends now it's all about the wind after talking about wind going to the next topic this next topic is hydrological site very small topic what is this hydrological cycle the cycle of water simple you call them as what water cycle the cycle of water in atmosphere you call them as what hydrological cycle the cycle that exists between evaporation condensation and precipitation we call them as what hydrological cycle the cycle which explains how exactly the surface water becomes water vapor and how this water vapor becomes cloud or goes for condensation and how this condensed material once again reaches the surface of the earth am i right that is what this hydrological cycle explains many things hydrological cycle or the name itself says it is nothing but what water cycle in the atmosphere hydrological cycle now one by one we have to take it and we have to discuss in detail for example how this surface water becomes water vapor or what are the different sources of measuring this water vapor how this water vapor becomes cloud right how once the cloud is being formed how exactly the precipitation is resulted one by one we have to take it in that way right first i'll talk about this atmospheric moisture what is this atmospheric moisture water vapor and atmosphere sometimes you call them as what humidity many things right so what is atmospheric moisture or humidity the amount of water vapor present in an air mass the amount of water vapor present in an air mass is called as atmospheric moisture or humidity simple it is all about water vapor 
present in one atmos. Either entire atmosphere I can take it or somewhere single, say, right? Somewhere, say, for example, one random air mass, if I am just taking it, mass of an air, three dimensional homogeneous mixture of air, if I am just taking it. Whatever is the moisture content which is there, water vapor content which is there inside this air mass, we call them as what? Humidity. Now, see, what exactly is the source of this water vapor? How this water vapor is added to the air mass or atmosphere, if you ask me? There are n number of sources, the most commonest ways what evaporation. How the surface water becomes what? Water vapor evaporation. Then transpiration. How exactly from the leaf of the plant, right? How from the leaf of the plant, say for example, this water is added to the atmosphere, right? From the leaf of the plant. Transpiration. Respiration. See, if plants can add, Flora can add, fauna can also add, we can also contribute, right? We also add water vapor. Every time we breathe out, water vapor is added. But one thing, 90% of atmospheric humidity is added through this process called as evaporation. All other are negligible. Somewhere when I talk about transpiration, it is 10%. It means 2 alone is somewhere contributing to 100%. All others are just negligible. Okay. Evaporation is followed by a distant second called as transpiration. Right? Evaporation followed by transpiration. Respiration also I said. And colder areas where exactly we have the larger ice caps, glaciers, right? There we'll be having what? Sublimation. We'll be having sublimation. Sublimation in the sense. Sometimes when I talk about the state of matter that changes, liquid becomes gas, or I should put this red. Solid will become gas. I'll make it. And talk about solid. You increase the temperature of solid. Solid becomes liquid. Further increase the temperature. Liquid becomes what? Gas. The solid directly becomes gas. This is what we call them as what? Sublimation. Right? Solid becoming liquid. We call them as what? Melting. Right? Liquid becoming gas. We call them as what? Evaporating. Solid directly becoming gas, we call them as what? Sublimation. We call it as sublimation. Then even volcanic activity, remember, right? Say, for example, last time it, when we talked about volcanic activity, we said any volcanic activity, after any volcanic activity, what is very common and normal is what? Precipitation. Because 70% of the water vapor that is, or the gas that is released is what? Water vapor. Okay. So these are some of the common sources of atmospheric moisture. I can also add my favorite word called as what? Etc. Okay. See, so don't take etc. very seriously. Take it in a lighter sense in the sense. Somewhere I should never come to a conclusion that these are the only ways how exactly atmospheric moisture is added. These are the only ways how exactly water vapor is added to the atmosphere. No, not like that. Okay. Right. Right, my friends. Now, how exactly it is measured? When I talk about measurement of humidity, how exactly it is measured if you ask me? Measurement. There are n number of ways that how exactly it is measured. One we call them as what? Absolute humidity. We call them as absolute humidity. When I say absolute humidity, it is simply you are measuring that what amount of water vapor is added. Okay. Or let me put it straight. You take one meter cube of an air mass. One specific volume of an air mass if I just take it. Right. All side one meter cube. One meter, one meter and one meter. Okay. You take it as 1 meter. For the specific volume of this air mass, what amount of water vapor is added, if I am just measuring it, I call that as what? Absolute humidity. But absolute humidity has a problem. What is the problem? Absolute humidity will be changing. Consistently it will be changing. When the temperature changes, absolute humidity will also change. So slightly better than absolute humidity is what? Specific humidity. Only one change. Instead of unit volume, we go for what? Unit mass. Go for unit mass. Instead of 1 meter cube of an air column, somewhere we say 1 kg of air column or air mass, how much water vapor is added? If I am measuring it, I call them as what? Specific humidity. Specific humidity at least helps us in differentiating the driest and wettest air mass of the volume. Going by the specific humidity value, the driest air mass is located in polar region. Don't take the value so seriously, but drier is polar region. Which is the wettest air mass is what? Equatorial rainforest. One thing I understand. You increase the latitude, what will decrease is humidity. Right? What will decrease is what? Humidity. 
Oke. Okay. Right. But what is a very sound way of measuring the same? Is a relative humidity. See, relative humidity is a ratio. It is a ratio. But this ratio is expressed in percentage. That's the reason we mark it as 100 percentage. Ratio expressed in percentage. Okay. In that way, my dear friends, when I talk about relative humidity expressed in percentage, what is the relative humidity? When I say it is a ratio, it is a ratio between the amount of water vapor, amount of water vapor, which is there in the air mass to its carrying capacity. Carrying capacity, you call them as what? The relative humidity. Amount of water vapor. See, for example, any air mass you take, right? Every air mass will be having a carrying capacity. For example, I have a glass of water. Right now, it has become empty. I was so thirsty, right? Now, somewhere my difference, okay, little water is there. I understand, say for example, this is an air mass, right? That is the carrying capacity. And whatever is the water which is added or whatever this water or water vapor which is actually there in that air mass, right? If I just take the ratio, I call this relative humidity. So, it is a ratio between the amount of water vapor present in an air mass to its carrying capacity at any given temperature. Because the carrying capacity will change with the temperature. Since it's a ratio, it is expressed in 100 percentage. So here, when somewhere, when I talk about amount of water vapor present in this air mass and the carrying capacity, both are same. It means this is a situation where this air mass cannot accommodate further moisture. That is a situation where relative humidity becomes what? 100 percentage. It becomes 100 percentage. That situation is what we call them as what? Saturated air mass. Relative humidity, we call them as what? Saturated air mass. We call it as a saturated air mass. Okay? Right. Now, what is the relative humidity? We have an idea. Now, if it is less than 100%, even if it is 99%, we call them as what? Unsaturated air mass. I repeat again. Relative humidity is a ratio between the amount of water vapor present in an air mass to its carrying capacity at a given temperature and since and it is expressed in percentage that's the reason you are multiplying it by 100 in that way right whenever relative humidity is 100 percentage we call them as what saturated less than that we call them as what unsaturated air mass see we have an extraordinary condition called a super saturation the relative humidity goes beyond 100 percentage. We call them a super saturation. Super saturation is not so common. Very uncommon. I'll tell you when exactly super saturation is common. I'll tell you. Right. Okay. Now, somewhere my dear friends, assuming that how one unsaturated air mass can be made it as saturated air mass if you ask me. Simple. I'm simply asking you how exactly relative humidity can be increased. Relative humidity can be increased either by increasing the amount of water vapor that can be supplied you add more amount of water vapor that is possible only when the wind is crossing or this air mass is crossing a water body or a forested region evaporation or transpiration will be adding that water vapor but what is very normal and common in the atmosphere is the reduction of carrying capacity right if you reduce the carrying capacity then yes things will fall in its way okay Right, my difference. Having said this, right, having said this, the most commonest way is reducing carrying capacity. How do you reduce the carrying capacity? Very simple, reduce the temperature. How do you reduce the temperature? Very simple, increase the height. That's the reason always we say mountains are very important in facilitating condensation. Why? Because as and when the air mass rises using the slope of the mountain, it becomes colder, 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 and colder. While it is becoming colder, this air mass is also becoming better, better, better and better. Why? Because relative humidity is increasing. Right? That's the reason. Right, right my dear friends. Now, that's all about atmospheric moisture. Now, coming to the second compartment of the cycle. You know what is atmospheric moisture? Now, the second compartment of the cycle is what? Condensation. It's equally important. We'll talk about condensation. What is condensation? Condensation is a process by which solid or gas either becomes liquid or solid what is gas here water vapor is the gas liquid water droplet solid is ice crystal so 
the process of water vapor either becoming water droplets or ice crystals you call them as what condensation my dear friends condensation when exactly condensation takes place what is the precondition one when exactly water vapor will become water droplets or ice crystals when it will be resulting in condensation what is the precondition for the condensation if you ask me precondition two things are there one is saturated atmosphere so you can also take the case of super saturated air mass. I am not denying the fact. But at least this air mass should be saturated. Relative humidity should be 100 percentage. At least. And hygroscopic nuclei should be there. It means some water seeking solids should be there. Some water seeking solids. When I say water seeking solids should be there, my dear friends. When I say water seeking solids should be there. Right. What exactly this water seeking solids? For example, you remember the Hermatan we discussed. It. Why exactly the large supply of aerosol has resulted in ready condensation and say for example precipitation if you ask me. The, all that aerosol actually acted as what? Hygroscopic nuclei. Even when I talk about cloud seeding, right? Somewhere say for example this silver iodide or this electrified sand will be somewhere thrown. Those electrified sand will be acting as that hygroscopic nuclei. Okay. Right. So, hygroscopic nuclei is also there. And one more thing, every raindrop you take, see, these are the solids, initial solids around which this condensation will be initiated. Slowly, suddenly, it will be growing in size. But for any condensation to start with, initiate with, some solid has to be there. See, that's the reason normally we say even the raindrops, right? You have a raindrop. This raindrops, my dear friends. Raindrops generally we understand that say for example normally we have a perception that raindrops are very pure. No, it is not very pure. Okay. It is not very pure because any raindrop you take, any raindrop you take, okay. this raindrop will be say for example having small small hygroscopic nuclei in it. That is the reason say for example even any vessel you take and if at all if I am just taking any vessel, if I am just collecting these raindrops, right or say for example you are collecting the rainwater directly from the sky, not from any terrace. After some times, if you allow the water to settle at the bottom of this, say for example, vessel, you will be finding small, small dust particles. All these dust particles are nothing but what? Hygroscopic nuclei. Any raindrop you take it, you will always have what? This hygroscopic nuclei will be there. Okay. So, what is the precondition for the condensation to take place? Two things. One is, air mass should be at least saturated. And number two, we should have what? Hygroscopic nuclei. Okay. Right, my friends. Now, Talking about forms of condensation. When I say forms of condensation, this condensation can happen either on ground or near ground or high in the atmosphere. On ground condensation is very popularly called as what? Dew or frost. Dew is a water droplet. Frost is an ice crystal. Near ground condensation is either called as fog or sometimes called as mist. Sometimes called as mist. Atmospheric condensations are called as cloud. Okay, right. Now here, first we will talk about this on-ground condensation. When exactly on-ground condensation is very common, I tell you. Before that, on-ground condensation, either it can be a dew drop. Dew drop is nothing but what? Water droplets. Frost is ice crystal. So what happens, my dear friends? Normally, it happens during this winters. Winters, what happens? Air masses very cold. So, what happens? It will be descending. When air mass is descending, subsiding air mass and this ground condition will be cold ground condition. Any air mass you take it, air mass will always have water vapor in it and this air mass when comes into contact with the ground, the ground is extremely cold and if this air mass goes for a condensation by the process of contact cooling, that the resulted condensation we call them as what? On ground condensation. See, how should I understand? Maybe, say for example, I have a bottle, very cooled, right? Say for example, a very cold water bottle. I am taking it from the refrigerator. I am just somewhere keeping it over a table or somewhere. Somewhere I am just keeping it. After sometimes you will be finding that small, small water droplets are formed on the outer surface of this bottle. From where exactly all these water droplets has come from, if you ask me? It would have come from what? The atmosphere. It would have come from atmosphere. So, all these water droplets, my dear friends, right, when it would have come to atmosphere, right, from the atmosphere, right, because this what, sorry, this surface is extremely cold. Coming into cold contact with the cold surface, it will be going for what? Condensation. Right? 
See, why exactly AC pipe? The water is dripping if you ask me. Very simple. The AC duct will be extremely cold. So, when the atmospheric air mass comes into contact with the cold surface, it goes for condensation. Okay. The same process happens during the winters also. Same process. Okay. Now, my dear friends, common during winters and condition should be cold ground condition. Ground condition should be cold and very important, my dear friends. Cloudless nights. It should be cloudless nights. Why I say cloudless nights, I will tell you. Because when during the night, if you have cloud, what happened? This ground condition will not become cold. Because cloudy nights, say for example, somewhere I understand if I have the cloud during the night time, this cloud will be somewhere reflecting back the terrestrial radiation. If it is reflecting back the terrestrial radiation, the temperature will increase. Okay. That's the reason somewhere we say on-ground condensation is very common on a cloudless night. Night should be free from what clouds. Okay. And see, on-ground condensation make it very simple. What is the dew? Dew is a water droplet. It means if the surface temperature is more than 0 degree centigrade, you will be having dew drops. Frost is ice crystal. If the surface temperature is less than 0 degree centigrade, you will be having frost formation. Right? Let's make the concept simple. So, what is on-ground condensation? We have seen. Then comes the near-ground condensation. Near-ground condensation, we very popularly we call them as what? Fog. And somewhere I have just given you the different types of fog. Right? Where and when and where, these are common. Right? But more than that, my dear friends, if I just talk about fog, I also come across another concept of what is mist. What is the difference between fog and mist, if you ask me? Fog and mist, my dear friends. Fog. Fog. The definition itself says near ground cloud. The cloud which is formed or somewhere all the way from the atmosphere, if it has descended towards the surface. You call them as what fog? Fog is nothing but what? Cloud. Cloud on the surface, you call them as what fog? Normally, we have an aspiration that we have to go high, we have to touch the cloud, we have to play with the cloud, right? Fog is nothing but what cloud. When the cloud comes, we don't even respect it. Okay. Fog is nothing but what a near ground cloud. Now, what is the difference between fog and mist, if you ask me? Dense, or I would say, right? Less dense fog, you call them as what mist. And talk about the difference between fog versus mist, my dear friends. Fog versus mist. As I already said, less dense fog, you call them as what mist. Less dense fog. Right. In that way, my dear friends, in that way, Normally, when I talk about the visibility, fog will be having a visibility of less than 1 kilometer. Whereas, mist will be having a visibility of 1 to 2 kilometers. Okay. This is what the basic difference between, say, for example, the fog and the mist as such. Fog and the mist. Okay. So, fog dense. If it is dense, you call them as fog. If it is not so dense, visibility is more, you call them as what? Mist. Then, what is very, very common? The most commonest form of Sorry, condensation is what? Cloud. I talk about cloud. WMO definition says cloud is a visible aggregate. Cloud is a visible aggregate of tiny ice crystals and minute water droplets. It's a visible aggregates of tiny ice crystals and minute water droplets. That's what the WMO definition says. It means cloud is a form of condensation. Cloud is an aggregation of liquids, water droplets. Cloud is an aggregation of solids, ice crystals. So, in this cloud, my dear friends, you can classify them on different bases. You can classify them based on shape. You can classify them based on height. You can classify them based on weather. Shape-based classification is very popular. For example, globular in mass, more vertical structure. Looks like a piece of wool or a cotton. You call them as what? Cumulus clouds. The most commonest cloud. Right? Any cloud, this will be the direct means. Symbol we'll be using it. Cloud means this is the symbol what we'll be using it. Okay. You call them as what? Cumulus cloud. Then a horizontal cloud which looks more sheet-like structure. It spreads more like a sheet-like structure. We call them as what? Stratus cloud. Sheet-like structure. 
Then very small thin fibrous clouds we call them as what? Cirrus clouds. Very thin fibrous clouds you call them as what? Cirrus clouds. This is shape based classification. Then you can also classify the cloud based on what height measurements. If I am classifying the clouds based on the height, then okay. Low altitudinal cloud, cloud which has their presence, for example, less than 2 to 2.5 kilometers of height, you call them as low altitudinal. 2.5 to 6, 7 kilometers, you call them as what? Mid altitudinal. More than 6 or 7 kilometers, we call them as what? High altitude. On the other hand, my dear friends, we can also classify the cloud based on the weather effectivity. Weather. Weather effectivity. Fair weather cloud. What is fair weather cloud? Cloud will be there. But no precipitation, fair weather. Then rain bearing cloud. Cloud brings precipitation, rain bearing cloud. Then comes bad weather cloud. This bad weather cloud is what we call them as what? Nimbus cloud, my dear friends. See, nimbus cloud is nothing but what? Intensified rain bearing cloud, we call them as what? Nimbus clouds, dark clouds. Even Kal Baisaki, we have used this word called as Kal, right? Dark. These dark clouds, very dark clouds, you call them as what? Nimbus clouds. Right? Bad weather cloud. When I say bad weather cloud, what exactly is a bad, bad weather effectivity that can be induced by cloud if you ask me? Right? It can be anything. For example, heavy precipitation. Technically, we call them as what? Cloud burst. When I say bad weather, my dear friends, Nimbus clouds particularly, cloud burst. Or I can talk about heavy precipitation. So, see, cloud burst do not have any definition. But normally I say if a, any particular place receives more than 10 centimeters of precipitation in one hour, you call this situation as what? Cloud burst. More than 10 centimeters, unimaginable. More than 10 centimeters in one hour is unimaginable, right? Like a waterfalls, right? Somewhere it will be falling, right? Somewhere it will be falling. That's what you call them as what? Cloud burst. Heavy precipitation. Then I will be having a hailstorms, my dear friends. Very large chunk of ice will be falling from the sky. Not small, small pieces. Very large chunk of ice will be falling from the sky. You call them as what? Hail. You call them as hail. Okay. And some, one more thing, when I talk about the large chunk of ice, northern plains of India, it is very, very common. This is a season. May month. So the season when you will start experiencing this, Hail strong, very big, large chunk of ice will be falling from the sky. And that is also associated with what? This Nimbus cloud. Lightning and thunder is also associated with what? Nimbus clouds. Okay. So that's the reason Nimbus clouds, we call them as what? Bad weather cloud, my dear friends. We call it as a bad weather cloud. Okay. Now here, how exactly cloud can be classified we have taken? And some of the places you will be finding that there are four types of cloud they will be giving you. Cumulus, stratus, cirrus and nimbus. But I should understand, nimbus classification is completely different. Nimbus classification is not shape based classification. Nimbus classification is weather based classification. Okay. Right, my dear friends. In that order, right. Somewhere, if I just take these four clouds, right. And if I just talk about the combination, the combination totally I have 10 different types of cloud, right. Uh, no need to remember all the 10 different types of cloud, but still, you'll be finding a pattern. What is this pattern? First, we are classifying this cloud based on the height, low, mid and high. You'll be finding a pattern that cirrus clouds, all the high altitudinal clouds are cirrus clouds. Independent cirrus, cirrus combining with stratus, cirrostratus, cirrus combining with cumulus, cirrocumulus. Okay. All cirrus clouds. Okay, all cirrus clouds. Then when I talk about say for example low altitudinal cloud, low altitudinal cloud, right? No more cirrus. We have cumulus, we have stratus. Cumulus and stratus combining together, we have stratocumulus. And nimbus clouds are confined to low altitude. It means nimbus cloud is not a separate cloud, my dear friends. If cumulus cloud becomes intensified, we call them as what cumulonimbus cloud. If stratus cloud becomes intensified, we call them as what? Nimbostratus. Okay. So these are the types of clouds. What we have? 10 different types of cloud. But among the 10 different types of cloud, which cloud is very important for me is what? Cumulus cloud or cumulonimbus cloud. Okay. 
Only this cumulonimbus cloud we'll take it and we'll discuss. Right? What is nimbus cloud? Already we discussed about. It. Okay, nimbus clouds. And one more thing, let me tell you. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, this cumulonimbus cloud will not be formed. Any mechanism, even cyclone. The next topic we'll be talking about cyclone. Cyclone is an intensified low pressure system, but we'll understand that. This intensified low pressure system itself need a precondition of existence of what? Low pressure. It means any cumulus, cumulonimbus cloud will always start as a cumulus cloud. So over a period of time, this cumulus cloud will become intensified to become what? Cumulonimbus cloud. Slowly, steadily, vertically, it will start growing. Why and how if you ask me? Simple. right? It starts growing vertically because of a very strong rising current. A strong rising convection means the rate of rise of an air mass should be very strong. Then exactly the rate of rise of air mass will be very strong. Right? It will be very strong if the temperature is what? Very, very high. Right? Now my dear friends, when this rise of air mass is very strong, what happens? Right? Say for example, this vertical movement within the cloud will also be what? Very, very strong. The vertical movement will be very, very strong within the cloud. Within the cloud. If the vertical movement within the cloud is very strong, that's what very technically we call them as what updraft and downdraft. So whenever the particles, the condensed material goes for a vertical rise and fall, right? Somewhere vertical movement within the cloud. Every time one cycle of this vertical movement is completed, it will start growing in size. Because whenever it is moving, it will start colliding with other ice crystals. And slowly, steadily, say for example, they will combine together to form a larger ice crystal. So more number of cycles of this updraft and downdraft it happens. This ice crystals becomes bigger, bigger, bigger and bigger. That's how it becomes what hail storm. Okay. So one thing I understand. Cumulonimbus cloud is not common. Cumulonimbus cloud is confined largely to a place where there is a very strong rising convection. Strong rising convection is generally confined to a place where the temperature is very high. It means... Wherever temperature is very high, only there I can have this cumulonimbus cloud largely common. See, I am not saying that other places you will not find a cumulonimbus cloud. right? Even if high temperature is not there, but some means if strong convection is taking place, I may find what? Cumulonimbus clouds. We call them as a towering cloud. Okay? Right. So that's all about condensation and moving to the last leg of Hydrological cycle, precipitation. Final cycle. What is precipitation? If you ask me, okay, give me an example of precipitation, I would say rainfall is an example of precipitation. Snowfall is an example of precipitation. So both the word, I have this, say for example, this word called as fall. It means what? Something is falling. Whatever is falling from the cloud. Whatever is falling from the cloud. From the base of the cloud, you call them as what? Precipitation. Right? You call them as precipitation. Whatever is falling from the base of the cloud, you call them as what? Precipitation. That's the reason. Definition itself says the gravity fall of the condensed material from the base of the cloud is called as precipitation. Gravity fall of the condensed material. Okay. So it is just effective, means falling with the effect of gravity as such. If it is falling in the form of a water droplets, we call them as rain. Immature rain, we call them as what? Drizzle. Correct. Similarly, if it is falling as a snowflakes, ice flakes, you call them as what? Snowfall. If it is falling as a small, small crystals of ice, you call them as what? Sleet. So sleet is nothing but what? Refrozen raindrop. Refrozen raindrop. Okay, so all the way from the cloud it will be dropping as a raindrop or a droplet of water, but by the time it reaches, because the ground condition may be slightly colder, right, it can somewhere freezes to become what sleep. Then what is hail? Large chunk of ice, you call them as what? Hail. Okay, so somewhere this is what the basic difference is all about. Right, right. Now, what are the forms of precipitation? These are the four major forms of precipitation. So, okay. All right, my dear friends. Then again, along with that, if you ask me what are the types of precipitation, see, though I use this word types of precipitation, 
directly or indirectly, we talk about how exactly the air mass goes for condensation. All these images, you find one thing is very common, air mass will be rising. Either air mass will be rising on its own or air mass will be rising taking some features help. Okay. What exactly you find is a front here. Okay. What exactly you find here is a mountain. If the air mass rises using a mountain, Oro, Oro means mountain. That precipitation formed, you call them as what orographic precipitation. Whatever precipitation you experience along the windward side of a mountain, you call them as orographic precipitation. Whatever you experience along the frontal regions, middle latitudes, front, the very next topic, next to next topic, we'll be discussing about a front. You call them as what frontal precipitation. And wherever the temperature is very high when the air mass is rising on its own, right? You call them as what convectional precipitation. Again, some of the local showers in India, they are convectional precipitation. <laughs> Wherever the temperature, equatorial region, what is very, very normal and common is what convectional precipitation. So, all this precipitation, types of precipitation, my difference. one thing, you find it very common. What is very common? Air mass is rising. Okay, right. So, that is all about hydrological cycle and now coming to the two types of cyclones, you call them as what? Cyclones. What is a cyclone? Intensified low pressure system, you call them as what? Cyclones, my dear friends. There are two types of cyclones. Cyclones confined to the tropical regions, you call them as tropical cyclones. Cyclones confined to the temperate regions, you call them as what? Temperate cyclones. See, you remember, globally when I talk about pressure bills, we have identified four pressure bills by name. Among them, two are high pressure and two are low pressure. What are the low pressures? Number one, it is equatorial low. And number two is what? Subpolar low. Subpolar low. These are the only two low pressure. My dear friends, let me tell you. Equatorial low is sometimes also called as ITC. So, tropical cyclones are the one which is confined or it is somewhere associated with ITC. Whereas, temperate cyclones are the one which is associated with what? The subpolar low. Okay, they are associated with subpolar low. So, where exactly the subpolar low is confined, they are confined to 60 degree latitude and the 60 degree latitude is what very popularly called as mid latitudes. That's the reason temperate cyclones are also called as mid latitudinal cyclones. Okay. So, tropical cyclones versus temperate cyclones. Temperate cyclone concept is simple. But the names what exactly it takes is what huge. Temperate cyclones, sometimes you call them as mid latitudinal cyclones. Sometimes you call them as what extra tropical cyclones. You call them as a wave cyclones or sometimes you also call them as what? frontal cyclones because front right now apart from that my difference right this is a basic difference right now furthermore if i just talk about the difference between this tropical and temperate cyclones my difference some basic difference if i just take it right tropical cyclones are generally confined to 8 degree to 35 degree latitude in continental water bodies continental water bodies means those water bodies which is surrounded by land because these water bodies are the one which will be having higher temperature. Temperate latitudes are confined around the 60 degree which is very popularly called as what? Mid latitudes as such. And let me tell you tropical cyclones the formation genesis is only over water bodies. It means they cannot have its formation over the land as such. Whereas temperate cyclones can have its formation both over land and water. Tropical cyclones are very intense. What we experience, coastal areas, Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, tropical cyclones. One is more coming, Mocha, right? The cyclone, what we'll be experiencing in few days, we call them as what? Mocha, right? Very intense. Temperate cyclones are less in intensity. Tropical cyclones are small in size. Temperate cyclones are very large in size. It means somewhere it can have a size of somewhere around 2,000 kilometers of diameter. Tropical cyclones are generally short-lived. Temperate cyclones exist for a longer period. And tropical cyclones, very important, my dear friends, they has an eye. They has an eye. The very center of the cyclone, which regulates the entire mechanism of a circulation, you call them as what? Eye. Right? Whereas this temperate cyclones, normally you don't have an eye. You don't have an eye. Having said this, my dear friends, we'll talk about these cyclones separately. When we talk about tropical cyclones, what we experience, we call them as a tropical cyclones, cyclones of tropical region. And the very definition, what exactly the definition says, you read. World Meteorological Organization, 1976, 
that we use to this term called as tropical cyclones to cover all that weather mechanisms or a system in which the wind speed generally exceeds the gale force. So what is a gale force? Any wind which flows up to the velocity of 63 kilometers per hour, you call them as what gale force. It means a wind which has a velocity of 63, more than 63 kilometers per hour, technically speaking, you call them as what cyclone. So any wind which has a sustained velocity of more than 63 kilometers per hour, we call them as what cyclone. And here is what the cyclone. Cyclone itself is defined based on what temperature. Now comes the question: precondition, preconditions that is needed for the formation of the cyclone. Precondition. What are the preconditions? If you ask me, my dear friends. Number one, high temperature. High temperature. How high? Somewhere around 25 to 27 degrees centigrade. Because cyclone is what low pressure. Low pressure itself should be resulted because of what high pressure. Sorry, high temperature as such. Okay, very high temperature. Then very interestingly, high amount of moisture. Because moisture will be having a latent heat. But forget about this latent heat. It will be having high moisture. Now what is the beauty? Whenever I just talk about high temperature, normally high temperature is confined to land. And high amount of moisture is confined to what? Water. It means cyclone can have its development in a place where land should behave like a water or water should behave like a land. What is more practical? is water body behaving like a land. That is what I call them as what? Continental water body. Water body which is surrounded by land will be having, say for example, more of what? They will be having the genesis of cyclones. Okay. Then Coriolis force. When I say Coriolis force, cyclone is a circulation. What makes it as a circulation is what Coriolis force. And my dear friends, very important. Because Coriolis force is absent in equatorial region. That's the reason cyclones are not confined to what equatorial region. Okay, see one thing. Land and water combination makes it continental water body but Coriolis force is the one which forces cyclone to have its presence outside the tropical, sorry, this equatorial region. So, where exactly I will be having cyclones, tropical cyclones, genesis, the continental water bodies of the tropical region, not in equatorial region. It means equatorial region will not have cyclones. Because Coriolis force is weak and very important. Any intense weather mechanism, I said, all of a sudden they will not get tempered. It means you need a pre existence of a depression or a low pressure. Okay, only then I will be having the formation of cyclone. It means some low pressure has to be there. This low pressure, if it is becoming more intensified, it can form into what cyclones. All of a sudden, right, from nowhere cyclones will not get formed. Okay, see how exactly we are saying that mocha will get formed, right? Mocha or Mocha, that's how what the next cyclones of this uh, right, Indian Ocean region you call it as. How exactly, how sure we are saying that it is going to form? Because I know this is a time when exactly low pressure will be formed either in Bay of Bengal or Ravi FNC. And there is a chance that this low pressure will get intensified to become what cyclones. Not necessarily this will become a cyclone as such. Not necessarily. Okay, right. Right. So, given all the facts, somewhere this diagram itself says that cyclones we do not have in the presence of what? The equatorial region. Only seven regions of the world has the confinement of cyclones. Gulf of California, Gulf of Mexico, Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, Mozambique Channel, South China Sea and Gulf of Carpentaria that is Australian coastline. Only seven regions of the world you have the cyclones and all these regions of the world cyclones are referred by different names. For example, North American Parliaments. Gulf of California and Gulf of Mexico, the system of cyclones are called as hurricanes. Whereas Indian Ocean region, IOR here means Indian Ocean region. Indian Ocean region, Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal and Mozambique Channel, cyclones are referred as cyclone itself. South China Sea, cyclones are referred as typhoon. Whereas Australia, cyclones are referred as billy wheels. Is how? Say for example, the different regions of the world, the cyclones are referred as. Naming the cyclone is different. Referring the cyclones by different terms is different. Okay. I am not here. I am not talking about naming of cyclones. No. Naming of tropical cyclones. This is how the cyclones are referred as. Or intense low pressure systems are referred as. North America always you call them as what hurricanes. Right. Hurricanes. Okay. Now, having said this, when I talk about cyclones, my dear friends, how exactly the cyclone look like? Structure of cyclone. 
See cyclone. All the cyclones, what I am just saying is what the structure, it is all about the theoretical structure. In that way, any cyclone you take in, the very center of the cyclone, you call them as what eye of the cyclone. Differentiation itself, I said, tropical cyclones will be having an eye. You will be having the eye of the cyclone. Okay. You have this eye of a cyclone. And see, eye is all side bounded by this eye wall. This eye is the intense low pressure system. Right. And any eye will be having, say, for example, one high pressure at the tropopause level. Correct. Now, here what happens, very center of this eye, I will be having the subsidence of this air mass from this eye pressure. And along the eye wall, I will be having the rise of this air mass in a spiraling fashion. In a spiraling way, it will be rising. Okay. Right, my dear friends. Having said this, having said this, somewhere, if I am just taking it, the very center of the, say for example, low pressure system, we call them as eye of the cyclone. We call them as eye. We call it as eye of the cyclone. And eye of the cyclone is all side is surrounded by this eye wall, my dear friends. Eye wall. And what dominates within the eye is vertical movement of air mass or instead of vertical movement, already the known term I am using it, you can call it as what? Convection. Convection means vertical movement of an air mass. It means what? Within the eye, I do not have rain. No rain. Interestingly, no rain. Not only no rain, my dear friends, it is no rain, no wind. Sorry, I should change it. First, when I say convection, it should be no wind followed by no rain. Okay. See, see the beauty. Cyclone itself is known for what? Very high precipitation and heavy high velocity of the wind. It is known for high velocity of the wind and heavy precipitation. But what exactly regulates the entire mechanism of cyclone called as eye of the cyclone is devoid of rain and devoid of wind. That's what my dear friends, when talk about say for example the rain zone, where exactly the rain zone starts, rain zone starts only from eye and say for example the precipitation intensity will decrease towards the outer margin. Very near to the eye wall, I will be having cumulonimbus cloud and slowly, steadily as you move away, I will be having this cumulus cloud. It means intensity of the precipitation, the velocity of the wind also will decrease. What is very, very important as I said, within the eye. See, eye is not a small structure. When I talk about this uh, entire cyclone, cyclone can have a somewhere, right? Somewhere cyclone, Now what cyclone made effects? You can have a size of somewhere around average, I said, 650 kilometers of diameter. Average cycle, 650 kilometer of diameter in that, somewhere around 30 to 80 kilometers will be that of an eye. Eye is not a small region. So this large region is generally devoid of rainfall and it is devoid of wind. Very interesting, right? Somewhere you come across a word called as landfall, right? Landfall. Normally when the cyclone enters the land, when half of the cyclone enters the land, then eye of the cyclone start entering the land, you call them as what? Landfall. So once you enter the landfall, somewhere, always, right? Opportunities always comes to us. You'll be having an opportunity. Somewhere if you have an opportunity of getting inside the eye of the cyclone, somewhere you will feel that eye is known for having its calm condition. Whenever in climatology we use this calm condition, calm condition means windless condition. So I repeat again, I is known for absolute calm condition. No rain, no precipitation. Sorry, excuse me, no wind, no rain. Right? The heavy precipitation and high velocity wind starts only from high wall and decreases towards the outer margin. Why no wind? Because of convection. Why no rain? Because the very center is known for subsiding convection. But I know only the rays of air mass will be resulting in what precipitation. Here also air mass is raising, but only thing is that in a spiraling way. And because of this, slightly say for example, the centrifugal effectivity will place the cloud outside this, say for example, this rays. Okay, right. Right, my dear friends. Now, any system has its own dissipation. How exactly cyclone comes to an end if you ask me? Cyclone dissipation starts with the landfall. What is a landfall? When cyclone enters the land, you call them as a landfall. Right? 
As and when cyclone enters the land, what happens? The frictional drag will increase. When the frictional drag increases, the velocity will decrease. The very nature of the cyclone will start losing it. Number two, my dear friends, lack of moisture. Because, you remember, when I talk about the precondition needed for the cyclone formation, moisture be said. Because moisture will be having latent heat. Latent heat will be intensifying this cyclone. Once it enters the land, the supply of moisture will be restricted. So, further intensification of the cyclone will become what? Weaker. Then blocking anticyclone. What is blocking anticyclone? I said, cyclone, eye of the cyclone is that? Say for example, that low pressure, you call them a cyclone itself. Cyclone is a low pressure. So, any low pressure at the surface will be having a high pressure at the propopause level. That is what you call them as what? Blocking anticyclone. So, what happens? After the landfall happens, what happens? This blocking anticyclone will start descending towards what? The bottom of this eye. Or slowly, suddenly, the blocking anticyclone will start descending. At one point of time, this blocking anticyclone will start replacing or occupying this eye. When a high pressure occupies a low pressure, all of a sudden, a neutrality will get established. Right? And that is the time, my dear friends, the cyclone comes to an abrupt halt. Okay? Right. So, that is all about tropical cyclones. And just before we conclude, just before we conclude, the direction of cyclone is also, you have to take it into consideration, very important. See here, normally cyclones are anti-clockwise in Northern Hemisphere. Only one you have to remember. For example, if I just say for example, right, somewhere try to remember how exactly the directions are. I will put it this way, right? So, let it be cyclones versus anti-cyclone. Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Only one I have to remember. Cyclones of Northern Hemisphere are anti-clockwise. Anti-clockwise. CW I am writing it as anti-clockwise. If that is the case, cyclones of Southern Hemisphere will be clockwise. If cyclones of northern hemisphere is anti-clockwise, anti-cyclones of northern hemisphere will be clockwise. Then anti-cyclones of southern hemisphere will be anti-clockwise. Okay. So, only one if I remember, my friends. Only one if I remember, somewhere if I remember. Right? Anti-cyclone alone if I just remember. Sorry, excuse me. Cyclone of northern hemisphere alone if I remember. I can remember anything. I can remember anything. So, remember... Kindly remember, if you are there in cyclone, cyclone is a circulation. What exactly is a circulation, right? The circulation, somewhere I understand, it is counterclockwise or anti-clockwise in another hemisphere. Only one I have to remember. I can eventually remember for all hemisphere, all the systems as such. Right? And finally, coming to the last topic of the day, temperate cyclones. See, temperate cyclones concept are very simple. Location, middle latitudes. What is middle latitude? Subpolar low is there. Where I have the subpolar low, this is the place where I have this temperate cyclones. What exactly happens at subpolar low? See, for example, subpolar low is the place where I have two contrasting air mass which tries to confluence with each other. Right? Somewhere at 60 degree latitude, my dear friends, two air masses comes into contact with each other. One, a wind which comes from 90 degree latitude. Another, a wind which comes from 30 degree latitude. The wind which comes from 30 degree latitude, because it is warmer region, this wind, what comes? You call them as what? Westerly. To be very precise, I call them as what? Warm westerly. Because it is coming from, right, a warmer region. A wind which comes from the Polar regions, you call the wind as polar winds, you call them as what? Cold polar wind. So, 60 degrees the latitude where two contrasting air mass is trying to converge with each other. Two contrasting air mass. One is, say for example, the cold polar wind and two is warm westerly. So, what happens? When two contrasting air mass, when it tries to converge with each other, they don't readily mix with each other. Say for example, the cold air mass and the warm air mass, they don't readily mix with each other. So, what happens? They form a clear-cut boundary between them. This boundary is what we call them as what? Front. 
we call them as what climatic front you remember even precipitation we said front is there using the front the warm air mass will be rising it will be resulting in what condensation and precipitation okay so what is a front front is a more like a boundary of an air mass okay now 60 degree latitude this front formation is what very very common now if i just see the next diagram what is it i'm just seeing right i'm just telling you right this is 60 degree latitude this is a place where exactly i have the subpolar loop subpolar loop this is a place where exactly i'll be having this cold air mass and warm air mass which is trying to converge with each other right now here what happens is cold air mass has a tendency to somewhere further push itself towards the warmer locations but warm air mass cannot push the cold air mass because warm air mass will be less in density so what happens because this cold air mass tries to push this warm air mass this front will start oscillating it it will somewhere it will start moving like a wave that's the reason sometimes we also call this cyclone as a wave cyclone wave stage is there okay remember somewhere when we named the cyclones other names we said right temperate cyclones what are the other names you call them as what one of the name is what wave cyclone because almost this front almost oscillates to become what a wave right at one point of time what happens is wave will break once the wave break here till here you will be not find say for example what is the front i understand boundary of an air mass i call them as what front this front itself i can have a cold front and a warm front simple boundary of cold air mass i call them as cold front boundary of warm air mass i call them as what warm front now what happens here my dear friends somewhere understanding says till here i do not have any difference between this cold front and warm front i don't have any difference between the cold front and warm front but here what happens after this breaks right cold front and warm front will get bifurcated right bifurcated and post bifurcation what i understand only this cold front will be going for a moment simple say for example somewhere i have a front this front is getting divided and into cold front and warm front and the cold front alone is going for a moment see because why only cold front is going for a moment rotation not the warm front because warm front given the density do not have the ability to move the cold air mass but cold air mass has the ability to move what warm air mass if it is pushing the warm air mass warm air mass will not further move to the lower latitudes instead warm air mass will start rising right maybe this three dimensional diagram i'll show you in two dimensional diagram see stage one the front is created there is no difference between cold front and warm front stage two the front is getting divided as cold front and number two as what warm front post division this cold front alone is going for a circulation right circulation circulation and circulation at one point of time when cold front completely occupies the warm front then we say the cyclone comes to an end so what is a temperate cyclonic circulation it is all about how a front right the stages are not so important for your prelims it is all about how a front front is nothing but what front is more like a boundary of an air mass how exactly this front is getting divided and going for a circulation okay so when it is going for a circulation automatically the warm air mass will be pushed up when the warm air mass is pushed up, right, it will be going for any air mass which is rising. It will be going for what? Condensation. It will be resulting in what? Precipitation. Okay. And my dear friends, generally, I already said this temperate cyclonic circulation generally results in mild weather mechanism, but very rarely, very rarely, this temperate cyclonic circulation may sometimes result in development of a squall line. What is a squall line? A region of a bad weather effectivity. I know what is bad weather effectivity. Normally, if you search at Google, it says it is a quasi-linear convective system, which is known for, right, lightning, thunder, heavy precipitation, hailstorms, etc. That's what in one word we said it is a region of bad weather. Very rarely, not every time, very rarely, right, temperate cyclones will rarely result in squall line. And the squall line will rarely become further intensified to become what? Tornado. Remember tornado, twisters, right? A kind of a say for example funneling type of a system you'll be experiencing right you call them as what tornadoes my friends is how somewhere tornadoes looks like okay a kind of a funneling type you call it as what tornadoes okay now see this gulf of mexico is one place where tornadoes are very common and what is very interesting gulf of mexico we have also seen as a region which is getting affected by what tropical cyclone 
is also getting affected by what temperate cyclones, right? But only season is different. Okay. Tornadoes are not very common. Tornadoes are rare. To be very precise, I should say it is the rarest of rare. Okay. Right, my dear friends. This is all about a temperate cyclonic circulation, right? The rest of the topics, some of the topics, what we have left, and still it is very important, monsoon, climatic classification, and others. We'll take it in the next class. So thank you and God bless. Keep preparing, keep revising it last minute, right? So increase the number of revision. Always they say it is better to read one book 10 times than to read 10 books once for at least for this competitive examination as such. Start believing in yourself. Do not doubt yourself. And that's it, my dear friends. All the best and God bless you. Thank you.